So uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to talk to you about some work uh, we've started in, in Manchester, my colleague Andre Jivkov uh, and I. Um, and it's really worked at quite an early stage um, and it's quite provocative and I'm offering it to you as, uh, as some thoughts really rather than as a, um, as a sort of completed piece of work. It's, it's some ideas that uh, we're developing that I think will help to move uh, the uh, solid mechanics uh, research uh, onwards and I, I'd like to take you through this little story. Well over the years, as, as many of you have, uh, <coughs> have discovered in doing, doing your, your uh, research in Fracture, is we have a, 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 a lot of challenges, um, not least of which are the issues of, of constraint, um, size, uh, plasticity, three-dimensional behaviour, and if you're trying to model fracture processes, these are very important things to take into account. We've got a very real challenge of the fact that the materials we're interested in are not homogeneous at a scale at which they are behaving. We like to use continuum mechanics, but re the reality is that we've got to homogenise the behaviour somehow. <coughs> We've also got the uh, issue that uh, particularly uh, fracture processes, the, the, the fracture events are occurring uh, throughout the material at, at sites in the microstructure. And what we have is distributed cracking, distributed damage. And really we want to challenge the fact that particularly cleavage cracking is not a weakest link problem. I know we tend to approach it as that, but it isn't. And these are, this is a, uh, stru uh, a structural steel, it's actually a ship steel, it's quite a dirty one. Um, we've uh, actually done some fracture experiments with a double notch, we've broken it, and then at the remaining notch, the surviving notch, you've got the behaviour just at the fracture event. The one, uh, these are, uh, I think, zero and minus 60 degrees. And what you see is this distribution of uh, pointer. Um, we have a distribution of cracking in the in the zone ahead of the uh, ahead of the notch and ahead of the progressing crack, and it's clearly not um, a, a weakest link, although it is convenient to to describe it as such. Oh, so we, we have here uh, we've got the notch here. We've got cracking occurring. In, in the region, we've got these cracks all over the place ahead, and these, many of these will will survive, even though the crack has passed through uh, elsewhere. Now that micro cracking, that distributed micro cracking, does affect the properties. So the, the larger the extent of the micro cracking, the different behaviours you'll get. The other thing that we <coughs> phenomenon we have is we. We rarely have a single fracture mechanism occurring. There's a competition between them. We might have an environment, thermal, or even just in straightforward fracture, we will have ductile and cleavage mechanisms occurring in, a, in, a, in ferritic steels. This is a fatigue crack that's then been loaded up. We have uh, um, tearing, we have blunting and tearing, ductile tearing at the crack tip and then triggering a cleavage event. Now that's actually qu quite hard to um, <coughs> model in, uh, in a priori way because you have these um, competing mechanisms and in fact the cleavage is triggered by the, um, the strains generated in the, in the ductile uh, tearing event. So we need to keep, if we're thinking of developing models, we need to have models in which we've got the fraction me mechanisms progressing in parallel and the co competition between them. So, what we came down to is the idea that we've really got to link, we're, not, we're never going to change engineers and, and commercial engineers and industrial engineers 
uh, in moving away from continuum models and, and finite element methods and so on. So we've got to find some way of putting our non-continuum models that are operating at the appropriate length scale, but we'll link those into uh, an engineering uh, toolkit. And that's, that's the basis that we started from and had a look around at what we, what we might do. And we've ended up having a generic, developing a generic term called site bond methods. And this describes the fact that we have a site or a, in, the, in our body, in our material, where we need to define the state of that material. So it might be cracked, it might be corroding, it might be um, uh, tearing or so on. And then we have um, a bond or an interaction between those sites which is a transport of some information, so a transport of displacements. Or it could be a physical transport, it could be a transport of a fluid, permeability. Um, it could be trans transfer of transport of heat. So we've got some communication between the sites in the material where the event is occurring and the, uh, the, the, the passage of information or, or, or a physical phenomena between these sites. And this is very to meso scale. So we're not looking at atomistic methods or molecular dynamics. We're looking at a meso scale where we might be looking at, at grains, so the state of the grain and the transfer of information across the grain boundary, for example. So that's important. So, we've, so we have this concept of site bond methods, and that's what we're going to develop. Now, we think these are, have got um, some significant advantages in that we get a natural length scale. The length scale comes out of the, the spacing between the physical events. So in a ductile damage uh, phenomenon, we've got the spacing between the inclusions where the voids are forming. The cleavage event, it's the spacing about two grains over which the, uh, the fracture event is occurring. And that's independent of any um, sort of mechanics or modelling uh, uh, length scale that we might do. So it's independent of finite load measure or any other dimension. Now, if we can do that, then we can deal with the breakdown in continuum mechanics at these length scales because we're dealing with it in a discrete way. And it allows us to bridge length scales because we can have events occurring at small length scales that they feed information up to events operating at larger length scales. So if we have parallel calculations, so we might have a calculation that's occurring at a 500 micron length scale for ductile damage and a 50 micron length scale for cleavage. We can have those calculations working away and the one that wins is the one that informs our continuum model, our finite element model further up. So in principle there's no reason why you can have lots and lots of length scales or even time scales. I mean, I, uh, my group in Manchester is doing a lot of work in the nuclear uh, power and there are time scales there operating from femtoseconds, which is the radiation damage, up to uh, 10,000 10, years, which is the storage of uh, nuclear waste in geological repositories. So we can, we, can, we can incorporate time as a dimension in here as well. Okay, oops. Right, so that's, um, that may be a sort of new concept, but actually what we've really done is just defined a new title or a new umbrella for a number of different methods coming from different um, communities. The fluid mechanics is one that you might well know of, um, a, a method called smooth particle hydrodynamics where you uh, uh, consider a particle or a site of a liquid and uh, have a, an interaction function um, between other uh, particles. Uh, these have got, these are, um, 
to make the animation work. Here it worked before. Uh, and these, these are elegant because you don't need to define a free surface. So this is um, uh, water uh, waves uh, on a breakwater, and we can get the interaction between the fluid and air, two fluids, water and seawater and air, and uh, concrete blocks here, uh, without having to define uh, the boundaries between the two fluids. And we get these free breaking waves and, and so on. So it's quite an elegant way of doing it. Um, uh, computation quite intensive, but it's um, it's an interesting approach and is very much one of the family of, of site bond methods. The solid mechanics, uh, some work in the US on uh, on peridynamics, uh, smooth <laughs> particle applied uh, mechanics, very much the same as that. And one uh, here from uh, former colleagues of mine, which are cellular automation fine elements, called CAFE, where the cellular automator deal with the behaviour at the site, and the finer element is the overall continuum calculation. This is really a site method, there's no bond in between the uh, cellular automator. And that's proven to be very good for fracture calculations. This is a, uh, a tensile, <coughs> tensile bar, notch bar, and um, what it is, is this is, is an abacus fine element, and in here there's, a, there's some cellular automator uh, working at the length scale of the ductile damage, and when those cellular automator say the state of the material has failed, then it tells the abacus model to delete those or kill those elements, and you get uh, this uh, as you would expect in tiny triaxial regions, you get the failure and the, and the, and the uh, you don't get a, the ductile uh, failure on, on the edge there. And then um, another, uh, another approach is again by, my, by Andre and some others, uh, which, which, which came from the really the site. Method, the site part of the, uh, the bond part of the site bond method, and so uh, his approach was to look at stress corrosion cracking, and the cracking there, the crack wanders around the grain boundaries, and some of the grains don't fail, and some of them do. And Andre's uh, contribution was to build grains up as truncated uh, uh, octahedra and define different properties on the faces and those faces then said whether they're going to crack or not and build the simulation up and what you get is the same uh, sort of behaviour regions where you've got ridges where the grain boundary is not cracked and regions where the grain boundary has failed by um, a stress corrosion mechanism. So what we did is we decided we'd try and put all these together uh, uh, and see whether there was any advantage in it. Now, the critical step in these site bomb methods is the coordination between the sites. So the early work in two dimensions being hexagonal array of sites and then 3D cubic bricks, hexagonal pyramids and face centered cubes but these all fail to capture even the simplest elastic properties of, of, of Poisson's ratio and the, the range of, of Young's moduli that you can, uh, you can get by um, messing around with the, the, the properties. And the reason they fail is because they don't represent the, the proper coordination. If you do um, the Veroni tessellations of space in a, in a sort of Monte Carlo method, what you end up with is you have an average of about 15 faces, about 40 edges, 27 vertices, and uh, uh, 5 edges per face in, uh, in, in, uh, if you, in, by, by the statistics. 
Now, a truncated octahedron comes remarkably close to that. It's got 14 faces instead of 15, 36 edges instead of 40, 24 vertices instead of 27, and five and a bit edges against five and a bit edges. So that's actually a very good representation of the, uh, in a regular uh, structure, of, uh, of a proper Verona um, tessellation. It's space filling, of course, and it's got two types of face. It's got a square face and a hexagonal face. So, if we're going to build the site bond method, we can tessellate the space with these sites and then have the communication between these two between faces. So, we put up our bonds or communication, two sorts. One of them will be one between the uh, the square faces and one of them B2 between the hexagonal faces. We take the, uh, the sites away and look at the, the bonds. The sites, the B1, which are the, uh, um, between the square faces and B2 between the hexagonal faces. To, to fill the space, we have a length L between the B1 sites. Uh, a length root 3 over 2L between the B2 sites. And here's the important bit. We allow each site to have six degrees of freedom. Now you'll, you'll probably recognize this um, by a number of different names. It's uh, Cossar elasticity or um, coupled stress methods or micropolar elasticity. They're all variants of the same thing. But what we're doing is in a computational way is building this up, making these as little beams, and giving the beams uh, six degrees of freedom. And we're going to alter the, 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 the stiffnesses of the bonds, the length of the bonds, and the diameter of the bonds. So we're altering the mechanics of these bonds in, in a structural, to do a structural model. So we've got that, so we can build this up, it's relatively straightforward to do, um, and We'll see what we get. And what we're doing is we're just trying to see whether this does a better job of capturing the elastic behaviour of, of a solid. So we're altering the diameter, the radius of the, um, of the bonds here uh, and just seeing how the overall elastic modulus of the structure of the solid uh, compares to the elastic modulus of the, of, of the movie find for the bond. And we get a relationship that basically the stiffer the bonds, the, bit, the, the stiffer the, the, the solid is, and all that's quite sensible, that's what you'd expect. To do the same thing, uh, we can change the Poisson's ratio of the bonds here, and we get the same, uh, we get another relationship as increasing it's strongly dependent on the, uh, the stiffness of the, of the bonds here, less dependent on the Poisson's ratio. And uh, this is the other bond uh, radi uh, radius. So we've got, we've got a, a surface, we've got a relationship between the, the elastic modulus. So we can get increasing, uh, increasing macroscopic elastic modulus for us. Our materials, we've modeled the behavior of the material by increasing the stiffness of our bond, increasing the modulus, or decreasing the Poisson's ratio. We can look at the macroscopic Poisson's ratio um, as a function of the bond uh, uh, stiffnesses, the bond radii. Uh, this is rather the same more complex relationship between them. Um, similarly here, the macroscopic Poisson's ratio is a function of the bond Poisson ratio and, bond, and, the, and the stiffness of the bonds between the hexagonal faces. Again, it's a, little, it's a complex relationship and also uh, similarly between the stiffness between the, the, the square faces. But what we actually didn't, uh, let's just go back to that. What 
you can see though actually is you, you, you can capture a very, very wide range of bottles ratio. So these are all Zetic type properties, negative bottles ratio and positive ones. So very, very wide range of possible behaviours by altering the properties of the, uh, the, the communication between the sites. So that's a very wide range of, of, of Poisson's ratios that we can get there. And then we can do the same, and just shear modulus, and you can get all these things out. The shear modulus of the, of the solid against the... Uh, and, uh, and so on. So let's, and that some of that behaves in much the same way as the um, uh, as the, uh, the elastic modulus, the, the, the axial modulus. So it's a function of the bond stiffness, um, linear, or it's proportional to the um, bond shear modulus in this opposite sense to the Poisson's ratio. Right, so now we've constructed that model, we can explore what it might do for real materials. We have a isotropic material, it's a special case here where we've got the, um, the, if you like, the, true, the true Poisson's ratio that we're calculating, it's actually equal to the Poisson's ratio that you get by, by measuring in a tensile test. Um, and it's a, it's that, it's that function. What that is, is it, it, it's the intersection of some of the planes on those previous uh, diagrams. I won't go through them here, but we've highlighted uh, some of the Poisson's ratio here as a function of the bond differences. Uh, and these are what these are, the green ones are the fields where isotropic materials will lie, and these are the projections on the other, on the other planes, on the other faces. So up here, this is where metals are, Poisson's ratio 0 0.28, 0 0.3-ish around there. We've got glasses and ceramics, I've actually done it in terms of Poisson's ratio here. That's the behaviour that you get in, the, in that space and projection on here. And that down there is what you typically get for glasses and ceramics. So you can just capture glasses and ceramics. And rocks and other cellular materials have, uh, can be down here, or sort of more or less zero, or uh, up here at around about 0.3 or so. And you can capture those, uh, they sit in, in, in these possible uh, um, domains of, of behaviour. So, relatively, um, we can capture, just by changing these very simple bond properties, we can capture isotropic materials of a very, very wide range of, um, of characteristics, a very wide range of material classes. So we're happy. So then we went on and said, well, something about cement. So cement, um, because Andre is working in the radiation waste uh, encapsulation uh, group as well, um, interested in the encapsulation of the nuclear waste in, uh, in, in cement and then putting it into uh, repositories. And cement, sir, uh, as many of you know, are a lot more expert than, than I am. Uh, they're not isotropic and therefore the uh, Poisson's ratio you get depends on how you've measured it. So if you measure Poisson's ratio in terms of, of measuring directly with, with torsion, and an axial test, you, you get a value of true Poisson's ratio of around in this sort of region experimentally. Even though, but if you assume it's isotropic, you actually get, tend to get much lower Poisson's ratios because they're not actually behaving like that. What I'm going to show you in the next slide, it's rather slightly, slightly complex slide, is that we can capture the Poisson, the, the Solid, the, the, if you like, the isotropic assumption of the, of the cement fossils ratio by just simply having a bond fossils ratio of 0.3, which is right in the middle of the, of the uh, 
and accepted uh, uh, local uh, Poisson's ratio. So if we just put the bond property of 0.3 in there, we can get out suitable selection of, uh, of our um, uh, bond stiffnesses. The solid, um, plus the Poisson's ratio of the solid, assuming, if, assuming it was an isotropic or equivalent to if it was an isotropic material. So we can go from point one three here right up to point five, but typically for, for cements we're down point three to point one three to point two in this sort of area. So we can find a set of bond properties that will capture the behaviour of the cement. And we don't assume that we don't have to assume, or we don't assume at all that it's it, that it's isotropic. We can accept that it's a, a, an isotropic material. Right, bullets. Well, two more slides. Um, so, having done this, and what we've done is we've put it, uh, identical properties in all dimensions, in all, in, all, in all the bonds. What we can do is do something that we did with the, um, the fracture models, the cafe models, is actually put different properties into the sites and into the bonds. And so you can now get a statistical variation, something more like a Monte Carlo. You can do it in your homogeneous component, in your homogeneous uh, field. So you can put a statistical variation of the site and bond properties, model a block, and get out the representative volume out of that. So you can have the properties of the, of the sort of a larger field coming out of that. We can delete bonds. So we can have distributed cracking or damage in there and see what the behaviour of the, of, the, of the larger model is. We can distribute cell sizes and represent texture. And what we can also do uh, is um, link these to other properties. So we can look at the change in permeability or thermal conductivity with damage. So um, by, by putting in the appropriate so where this thing will go to with this, we think it will it'll work for cleavage fracture, the site is the state of the grain, whether it's a crack or not, the, the bond is the transfer of stress and strain mechanics, the characteristic length is the grain, ductile fracture is the state of the inclusion where the void is forming, length is interparticle spacing, permeability, transport of fluids, change of modulus due to micro cracking and so on. So lots and lots of variations that we could do uh, if, we, um, if we pursue this idea. The challenge is, um, is uh, acceptance by our scientific uh, academic peers. We're finding a certain amount of opposition to that at the moment. Um, developing some algorithms, and we've got a couple of research students working on, on that and working on a toolbox so that people can use this quite simply. And also the verification and validation of, of this, which, and again, we've got a student working on trying to uh, get some data to help us do that. So, here's my controversial thing. I think site bond methods are the future of solid mechanics, or at least solid mechanics simulations, and um, I'd like to leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. <laughs>